And you know, I believe the quiz, the grades were very good. I, I, I don't have the other. Yeah? How, how many more quizzes are we going to have? And like, when can we expect our last exam? Uh, the last quiz, you mean? Uh, yeah. I'm just. Uh, we get, I, I, I'm going to say we're trying to get a quiz in once a week until the last uh, week or, of classes, I believe. So we got this week, we got uh, one more, so two, one after, I, somewhere between two and three, to be honest with you. I didn't actually do a count. Most of the time when I do a course, I don't structure it where we have to have it. And here's the reason. After COVID, I learned one thing. Don't assume everything's going to run smoothly. And uh, in other words, if we have to go I don't know, online for a week or something like that, I got I just got to be ready. Now, the final exam, in case that anybody doesn't know, this is available online. I think if you go to the Canvas website, there's this place. I'm not sure how the students view this. But all the information for the final exam schedules is online. Do you all know that class? And by the way, does anybody know the date of our final? I don't actually know. I know it's there. December 7th, what time? Tuesday at what time? 12 till um, 2.30. And it would be here. Pardon? I'm sorry, what? It, it is a Tuesday, December 7th, from 12 to 2.30 in this room. Now, some courses have finals in alternate rooms on poll. I don't know if that's still going on, but as far as this course goes, the final will be in this room. And I want to make sure everybody knows that. Has anybody had finals in different rooms? Yeah. And some finals are at night on poll which I find appalling, because what if you have a job or something? Anyway, that's it. Now, questions about the homework or anything like that? Anything related to class? I had it. Yeah. Is it final cumulative? Yeah, oh yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, what usually happens in the final exams, students have been making small mistakes on quizzes, and maybe they had some trouble on the test. If they're serious, they usually do very well. Students that are just, I hate to say it, the heart's not in, the bottom falls off. And that's where I see the biggest spread in grades. I will see a lot of very high grades, and I mean hundreds. And I'll see a lot of people who get fours to tens. Not a lot. Enough to cause me to really worry about, you know, where their head is and what they're thinking. Because this is not a class that you, there's social promotion. You have to understand this and pass it. And I, don't, I think you only get two cracks. I'm not sure. There's, there's a limit to the number of times you can try a course if you fail it or you withdraw. And it's, it's three. Is it three? I think it's three. And it doesn't, if you withdraw before the withdraw date, it doesn't count as uh, the assessment. OK. Now, the reason I'm saying this is some of this is like revelation to some students who didn't know that. And then all of a sudden, they get something in the mail that they're no longer in engineering. And I, I do know this happens. So just remember, there are requirements for the number of times you can take a course. And I don't even know. I think you have to make a D or better, don't you, in this course? I just I don't know all the requirements for different majors. Just be aware of them so you don't hurt yourself. And, and there's nobody in here who I, like, mentally can't do this if they put their heart in. I'm, I'm convinced all you people are, most of them are very bright, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of time. But you have to be serious. That's the deal. Okay, and the nice thing about this course, last thing about this, everything builds on prior work, so it's not like you have to review Ohm's Law, brand new all the time, or Kirchhoff's Current Law, Kirchhoff's. Everything keeps on building on prior work, and that's the nice thing. So you're always refreshed. With the, you have to stay current with all the stuff. All right, any other questions about um, the problems I gave you? We did, we did the... Um, I gave you a series of problems that had to do with the magnetically coupled circuits, right? Out of, I'm just level with you so I know what kind of group I'm talking about. How many tried them? All right, not a whole lot. Um, it would be useful if you did for one reason. The transformer stuff that you will be tested on for, if you understand mutually coupled circuits, transformers are very easy. 
Uh, that's the reason. So I'm, we're going to be doing transformers. We're going to be doing ideal transformers next. And if I give you a problem that deals with magnetically coupled circuits, please hear me. It will be something that can be solvable with the calculators you have. Did you all notice how on Friday I worked a problem that was magnetically coupled, but I got I2, or I1 in terms of I2, and then solve for I2. You all know that? So you can do it with any calculator, but you will require one additional step because you'll have to do a substitution instead of a matrix solution. That's the only difference. And I wouldn't ask you to do something that was impossible with the, with the calculators you have. Okay, now we've done all of three-phase circuitry. Now we've just got done with magnetically coupled circuits. And now we're talking about ideal transformers. Are, are there any questions about magnetically coupled, whether you did them or not? Because I gave you a series. How many tried these problems again? Did you have any problems at all with them? <coughs> Nothing. Okay. I mean, they're straightforward, right? They're just straightforward equations, and it's simply using Kirchhoff's voltage or current laws. But again, until you do a few, you don't know you know how to do them. That's my thoughts on that. So when we talk about ideal transforms, I showed you that really what we're talking about is something like this. And there's the standard dot convention. There's going to be a V1 and a V2. And there's going to be an I1. But here, instead of going into the dot, they do this and have it coming out. There's a reason. There's also a turns ratio. Here, on this side, the primary would be N1, and on the secondary, N2. This side is called the primary. This is the secondary. And that's a standard, I mean, that's the way it's drawn. I'm going to throw in one thing, just because a lot of you people are going to be using transformers in your work, or you have to at least understand. Especially MEs and AEs. Uh, industrials, I don't, I don't think so, but I can't say that with much authority. That symbol means it's an iron core transformer where it's low frequency. Have you ever been in an old TV or radio or even modern stuff where you see a black squarish kind of block that's kind of heavy? That's a transformer. And the transformer takes a voltage and it either increases it or decreases it based on the need. And that's what these turns do. Now here's what really happens. The ratio of the turns, there's N1 in the primary, N2 in the secondary. So if we have V1 over V2, that's proportional to N1 over N2. And that's the right, I mean, that is the right equation. Polarity's right and everything like that on this. Then if I take I1 over I2, that's, in, that's inversely proportional to this, or it's equal to N2 over N1. And I'll get to why that's the case. Notice the polarity. They're both positive. Now I'm going to just make a comment that I want you to understand. Remember what, with magnetically coupled circuits you had I2 going into the dot? Do you all remember that? If that was the case, then there would be a negative sign here. So what they did is everybody a favor. They got rid of that negative sign and have I2 going this way. This is your standard, the standard way a transformer is defined. Are you all with me on this? Now, there's a few other things that come out of that. And this is kind of important. One of the things is called, yeah? Are there situations where the transformer is not in the standard uh, definition? that we'd encounter in real world? Well, I'll put it to you this way. In, in, in the Western world, where the standard, there's a, a thing called NIST, the National Institute of Standards. Up in Washington, there's also an equivalent to that in Europe and in Asia, and I don't know the acronyms for them, for specifically electrical stuff related to power. But uh, the FCC is the Federal Communications Group in this country, 
there's CISPRI over in Europe. All these groups have large sets of standards that they use to define things because so many different groups have to understand what the other groups are doing. These are just, it's the way it is. So that, that is a standard type of thing that will be used all throughout the Western world, and I'm sure it's even used in the non-Western world. It's just the standard, sort of like milliliters is for measurement and stuff like that. <coughs> I mean, these will be standard. Now, there's something that comes out of this, and what I'm about to show you is important. That doesn't make much sense in and of itself. Usually, when they have transformers, you have a primary connected to a voltage, like so, source voltage, all right? Now, this has to be an AC signal. Does everybody remember me telling you transformers only work when you have time variation, right? A DC signal will not, these, these equations don't apply at all. Nothing happens to the secondary voltage with DC, a DC signal on the primary. Then I'm just going to go ahead and put in the primary here. Now that dot, what does the dot again signify or denote anyone? The positive side of the voltage at that, on those terminals. So. And, you know, there are reasons you won't have iron core. You won't have those two lines. They're called air core transformers. They're for very high frequency circuits. But for most of the stuff you're going to do, it's iron core. And I want to tell you one thing about transformers. Keep in the back of your mind if you ever you are around them and have to build stuff, they're heavy. Transformers are heavy, and they're expensive. When we built the amplifier back in the day when I was a student, long ago, uh, one of the things that was on the horizon everybody was trying to do is get really high fidelity, high fidelity sound equipment. And it was expensive. It was thousands of dollars for high-end high and stuff like that. So as electrical engineers, we could build our own amplifiers. And we did. We could build them so they didn't have any intermodulation distortion, no harmonic distortion. Of, I mean, nothing to measure. This is before digital stuff. I want you to know this is in the analog world. But the one thing we couldn't do is couldn't fabricate a transform. You had to buy them. They were expensive. But what we did have was a salvage yard where all the stuff from 1930 before we vacuumed through there, and there's large transformers in these things. Transformers don't rock. We would go down there and rip them out. We'd get a transformer that might cost us four or $500. No, that's an exaggeration. $50 to $100. And but what we can do is we can take that and then we can get the signal we want, the DC signal, because that's the thing that's going to cause the power and it's expensive. And then we design the circuitry and all that was kind of a piece of cake because you can over-design. You don't care if you're spending five cents more. But if you're trying to get something out the door and make money, five cents is a big deal per, per item. So anyway, we did this and this was the big expense. Keep that in mind. They're expensive generally. All right. Even in the digital world, transformers are still expensive, real transformers. So this is V1. This is V2. This is I1. Please watch this. This is important. And this is I2. And now I'm going to put a load out here. ZL. But what I want to do is see what that load looks like here. It's called Z reflected. Now let me explain this. Suppose I'd like to know something about this. And I'm going to call this N1 and this N2 <coughs> as the transformer ratio. Y'all follow me? N1's on the primary always, N2 on the secondary. Now here's my thought. Suppose I don't want to know all about the transformer and load. I'd like to know what the equivalent impedance would be here that would be identical to what happens there. I can reflect that impedance to this side if I know the turns ratios. I'm about to show you how, okay? Y'all with me on this class? Please watch this, it's important. So, y'all agree that these equations work. So if I know that V1 here, and I'll do it here, if I know V1 is Vs, by definition, do you see that's true? Everybody? It wouldn't be true if there was a resistor here, but there's not. Therefore, I know that I can get V2 
is simply going to be V1, right? V2 here would be V1 times N2 over N1. Agreed? And again, I just modified that equation. What really happens is this turns ratio, say it's 1 to 10, if this is 1 volts, this would be 10 volts. If this was 10, this would be 100. So really, the output voltage here, if this is 1 to 10, would be 10 Vs. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm just trying to give you something in your mind to think about. So that means my V2 is the turns ratio times v Vs. Y'all agree? That current is defined by uh, N2 over... Not current yet. This is just voltage. I'm going to get the current, but I just want you to focus on voltage. You all see that? We'll go through problems, examples in a second. I just want to make sure I'm clear about this. All right. Now, he's jumped ahead, but he's right. That means the current I2 is what? Anyone? V2... Divided by ZL. Isn't it, class? Can you all see that? If I know what V2 is, is it V2 over ZL? How many, can you all see that? It's in parallel, isn't it? Show of hands so I know you can see. All right. So that means that I2 here is V2. Maybe this is confusing you right here. I'm not trying to. I'll just say this as N1 turns and this as N2. That's the way most problems are stated like this. So that means I2 is V2 over ZL, or it's simply going to be V2 is Vs, right there, right, times N2 over N1 divided by ZL. Can you all follow me? I'm just getting the current based on the voltage from a source that's into the secondary and now I'm finding the secondary current. Correct, class? All right, now what is the primary current? Well, I1 is equal to N2 over N1 times I2. And you'll notice what happens here. It's N2 over N1 times I2. And I2 is this, so it's N2 over N1 squared. Right? And then it's times Vs over ZL. I want you to just take a look at that. You all agree with that? Please take a look. Can you all see what I've done here? Anybody know why I did that? I bet you a lot of you see it. Because what is the imp impedance right here actually looking at? If I looked at Z in right here, that way, isn't that a ratio of voltage to current at that point, class? You all follow me? If I knew the voltage here and the current going, I know the impedance, don't I, class? So if I take Vs over I1, there's I1, so I have Vs over <coughs> quantity N2 over N1 squared times Vs divided by ZL, or I really have simply N1 over N2 squared times ZL. This is important. So N1 over N2 is the turns ratio, right? And I'm squaring it times ZL, and that would be the input. Now let me be practical about this and give you examples. So this will make it real to you, and it'll keep you, it'll, it'll stay with you. You all follow me what I'm trying to do? I'm just saying, if you got a transformer, you know turns ratio, and you got any other load here, you can reflect that load here. Forget about the transformer if the only thing you want is I1, right? 
This is important. So let's go over here and now do something and make it real practical. So if I have a voltage source <coughs> plus the minus, I uh, just say 10 volts right there. And I'm going to use peak here, doesn't matter. And I put a transformer here. And I'm going to say this is a, uh, say, one. And here's a secondary. Most of the time it doesn't say primary or secondary. And they'll have this to 10. It means for every one winding on the primary, there are 10 on the secondary. Do you all follow me on this class? You could put N1 is 1, N2 is 10. That's not really true. N1 is probably 1,000, N2 10,000, something like that. It's always a ratio. Do you all follow me in that class? The only thing we care about is the fractional ratio. N1, yeah. Hold on. Okay. Subscript, uh, the Z is like Pardon me? What's that subscript that the Z is like ZN, you can call it reflected. It really doesn't need, you can call it anything. Uh, they'll call it reflected. It's just whatever the impedance is in the secondary, how does it look to the primary? It's called reflected through the transformer oftentimes. And I'm gonna have a one to 10 transformer and I'm gonna have a load here of say 10,000 ohms. And we're gonna go through a series of questions and answer them that are typical. First question is, what is this current I1? There's the first question. And you all know, I didn't put this down here, but this would be V1, and this would be V2. Do you all agree with that? And this would be I1, and this would be I2. All right, so we're gonna do it. You all with me? Please be attentive, and believe me, you'll thank me. It won't be hard at all. When I look at this, I'm gonna erase all that so I can write here. And I'm gonna tell you some practical ways I think about these problems. Here's some practical advice. Whatever side has more turns has a higher voltage. Y'all hear me? More turns, more voltage. It comes from this. If I have one to 10 here, means the output voltage is 10 times the input. That's it. Y'all follow me? If it was one to 100, this output voltage, or the V2 here, would simply be 100 times Vn. It's that simple. You all follow me? Now, if voltage goes up, current goes down inversely. So if the voltage is 10 times this, this current will be 1 tenth I1. The product of current and voltage is a constant for primary and secondary. Everybody got that? That's it, and that's the way I view them. Now the reflected impedance is this. More turns on this side, high impedance. Less turns, low impedance. How much less by the square of the ratio? All right, now I'll show you what I'm talking about. I just showed you that the impedance right here, I wrote the equation a second ago, had to do with what? The secondary impedance really times the turns ratio squared. And when I say turns ratio, it bothers you the way I'm using it because you haven't really done problems with this. But I'm gonna show you this. My Zn right here, or the equivalent impedance of this, would simply be Z load, and then it would be proportional to N, or N1 over N2, or one over 10, square. Remember, the secondary has 10 times as many turns as the primary. The impedance there will be 
a hundred times as much as the primary side. Y'all with me? I can show you this, but I want to make sure you see it. So this means when I put in ZL is 10,000, this is 10 to the fourth ohms over 10 squared ohms, or this is 100 ohms. Do you all see this? Right? We, could, we don't have to do it that way. I'll show you why. Do you all see I give you 10 volts there? All right. 1 to 10, it means the output voltage V2 would be what? Uh, it would be 100 volts, right? 10 times V source for 100 volts. Do you all agree with that? Now keep watching. If it's 100 volts, what is I2? One hundred divided by ten thousand. Right, by ten thousand, right? Or it'd be one over a hundred, right? You agree with that? Amps, right, class? All right, what's the primary current? I one would be what? Ten times I two, right? or 0 0.1 amp. Do you all agree with that? Y'all follow me? I'm just going through the, the basic equations, right? And what does that make the input impedance? It makes what? Input impedance V uh, Z in would be input voltages 10 input current, or I should say primary current, which is I1 is 0 0.1 or one tenth makes this 100 ohms, right? You can see how we calculate as 100 ohms right here by just using the turns ratio squared. Y'all see that, everyone? That's really how easy it is. Now you see how I got all these values either by using the ratio of, I mean, the, uh, the V1 over V2 is N1 over N2, or I1 over I2 is N2, right, over N1. Remember that, class? You can do it either way, but it's much easier to just say, well, it just gets reflected in Pete's right Y'all with me, class? Now, this is a very simple problem, but it shows all the things you need to know. All of them. And the best way I can do this is now I'm going to show you some problems that we'll do. And again, the only thing we've done here is introduced one new component, a transformer. Everything else is old hat to us. Y'all with me? And I'm going to go ahead and do that. How many have used transformers in your laboratory work and, I mean, hobbies, anything like that? I figured about half of you have, um, but I might be wrong because it doesn't look like it's that. I'm going to tell you most of you will be around a transformer in some way, shape, or form or have to be aware of what they do. And the other thing about transformers, I'm going to tell you this. If you want them to be efficient at high frequencies, they probably get very expensive. I'm just telling you that. The reason I'm saying that is there's a whole lot of discussion about using higher frequency, I guess, links, data communication. I can't say that with authority, but I have a suspicion because I know something about the problems they would. Um, anyway, that's the ideal transform. Let me go through the problem, see how you do this with this. And work, I mean, work with me on this one, because I think this is the best way to learn. This is an example. So I'm going to start with a source voltage here of plus to minus 120 at zero degrees volts. Now this is going to be peak. Then I'm going to have 18 ohms here. This will say this. 
That is interpreted as for every four turns on the primary, there are one turn on the secondary. You all see that, the way I put it here? I put first number, then a colon, second number. First number is proportional to the turns of the primary. Second number proportional to the turns on the secondary. You'll notice the dots there. And this is, he calls this V1 here plus to minus, but he has V2 with the positive here. I'm actually going to call this V2 because I like to always do it that way. That way the equations work. The equations are for always having this is plus, this is minus. You all with me, class? Um, so I'm going to do it that way. And then I'm going to put this as I1. And what he does is have this is I2 coming out here, but this I'm going to leave as I2. Um, so now we're going to go ahead, and what we're going to do is this. We're going to get I1. We're going to get V1. We're going to get I2. And we're going to get V2. Y'all follow me? Now, I've presented you what a transformer was. How, what would be my, what would be your first step in figuring out how to answer this problem? Think about it for one second and let me know what you think. How many have an idea? You don't have to. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to. Anybody want to make a suggestion? Uh, we can do that, but I'm going to show you the problem. Don't we need an impedance equivalent for V1? Because we don't know what the impedance is, so you're absolutely right what he said, but here's what we need to do. Remember I told you about the reflected impedance off the secondary? Well, we're going to replace this with the reflected impedance from over there. Do you all see what I'm talking about, guys? All right, so follow me. I'll draw the primary again. So this is plus to minus 120 at an angle of 0 degrees volts. Then I got 18. And I have minus J. 4 ohms. Now, here's where I'm going to go get the reflected impedance and put it in there. Now, follow me on this. This is a transformer. On that side, my load is 1 plus J1. Do you all agree with everyone? In the far back, can you all see this, guys? All right, I mean, sorry, 2 plus J1. It's four to one. More turns here, more impedance. Y'all hear me? More turns this side, more impedance, less turns less. So this two plus J1 is going to be magnified by the ratio squared. It gets bigger. Y'all with me when it comes to the primary? Well, what, what do you mean more turns? There's more, really more is just the numbers larger on the primary than the secondary. Y'all with me? It's four turns here for every one turn on the primary. I mean secondary. So what happens is voltage more on this side, current less on this side compared to the secondary, and the impedance on this on the secondary is going to be magnified or goes up by four squared. You all with me on that class? So that means the impedance here is going to be four squared. And I'll just put it as Z. This value of Z primary is going to be 4 squared, or 16, times Z secondary, which is 2 plus J1 ohms. Are you with me? Yeah. So this is the same as the Z and Z reflected that you mentioned earlier. Right? That's it. We've got, uh, this is Z reflected. This is the reflected impedance from the secondary to the primary side of the transform. I hope you understand this transformer is basically transforming the secondary's impedance. 
it's taking a relatively small impedance, 2 plus J1, it's going to magnify it by a factor of 16 because that's what the turns ratio is. So that means on the secondary, now I have 16 times 2 or 32 plus J16 ohms, right, for this. Y'all follow me? Now, and he was right about what he said about getting V1, and we're about to get V1. You can get it a couple of ways. How would you get V1 right here? Because that would be this V1, wouldn't it? How would I get V1? Uh, the source voltage times the... Uh, You're right. Uh, ZP. The, uh, the division? Well, what he's really saying is we could use voltage division. How many see that? Right? So voltage division says take the source voltage 120 at 0 degrees. I'm just going to leave it as 120 times this impedance, which is ZP, which is 32 plus J16, right? Over the sum of this impedance from here to here plus that impedance. Or over the sum of 32 plus 18, right? And then it's going to be plus J16 minus 4. I'm going to get out of your way. And you see I took source voltage times the impedance ZP right here over this impedance plus this plus that impedance. How many see this right here? Can you all see it in the far back? What is that value? If you have calculators, please help me. I'd like a magnitude and angle. I don't think it's that bad. But I could be wrong. Magnitude and angle, if you can. That's, that's absolutely right. Out of curiosity, how do I get the current I want? This current. So that was 83.5. How do I get this current? Well, I'm going to just suggest one thing. If I want this current, I mean, there's several ways. How about we just take this voltage over the sum of all the impedances, right? This impedance plus that impedance. Do you all agree with that? I think we're safe that way. Sure, I can say that I1 would be 120 volts at 0 degrees over 18 minus J4 plus, and this is 32 plus J16. And what's that in terms of magnitude and angle? You'll see, this isn't that bad, though. Just why don't you get a little familiar with it? Anyone? Uh, 2.3 at an angle of negative 13.5. <coughs> 2.3 at what? Angle of negative 13.5. Okay. So that's I1, right? We're not done. How do I get my V? So that was. 2.3, this is amps. How do I get I2? Now remember, more turns, more voltage, less current. Less turns, less voltage, but more current, right? The ratio. So here, I, whatever the current on this side is, I'm going to multiply by 4 to get the current on this side. Y'all follow me on that, everyone? How do you know it's over here? Uh, 
because I say so. <laughs> there's no, we're not going to do non-ideal. Lossy transformers are something electrical engineers don't mess around with until they're really seniors or in grad school. Lossy transformers are non-trivial kind of things. So if you get online, don't look at lossy transformer analysis. It's very common. They talk about hysteresis and all this stuff, core losses. Don't worry about that. Uh, anyway, what would I2 be again? Four times I1, right? Just multiply that by four. So is that 9.2? Right? Yeah. That angle is still minus 13.2. Five degrees amps. What about V2? V1 divided by four. Divide that V1 by four. If you're like me, I'm thinking about that beautiful day outside. Why am I here? Well, to be honest with you, because if I'm not, I'll probably get fired. But. It's a uh, 20.9 and then look 13.1. 13.1? Mm -hmm. Is that one? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's he's got 13. 13 now, yeah, I believe it. Y'all follow me on this? Now here, we've done the voltages and currents. I'm going to ask you a question. And these are the kind of things you have to be aware of. Remember the analysis I showed you was for the designations where the voltages and currents, current coming out of the dot in the secondary, going into the dot in the primary, voltages always having a positive terminal on the dot, right? And measured across the transformer. And then you have the ratios of the V1 over V2 and I1 over I2 that I gave you. However, in the real world, Voltages can be designated like this, and I'm asking you a question. It's actually going to be something you have to understand for the quiz on Friday. So, what if I wanted this voltage, and I just happen to call that V2? Suppose purple V2 is not black V2, in other words. Negative uh, terminal. Second? Uh, negative terminal. How many see there's a real simple way to get this based on the prior answers? Do you all see that this voltage is just the negative of this voltage? How many see that? Now that's important. So you, if you were asked for that voltage right there, you wouldn't write equations that had this purple voltage in there. You would write equations that had that voltage in there. You all follow me? Because that's the one you're used to. How many see that? Now, once you calculated that voltage, then you put your little purple voltage here and say, oh, that is just the negative of what I calculated. You all follow me? Because here's the danger. If all of a sudden the problem has this labeled as V2, like that, you're, oh my God, I've got to change all my equations. No. You solve the equation, you solve the problem as if it was like this. Then at the end, you adapt your voltages to the voltage they designate. Y'all follow me? And this is an old trick. Just make sure the engineer's heads work so you're rational. Because, oh, that's not V2. V2 is just an abstract concept. I could put that V, I don't know, zeta or something. It just means the secondary voltage measured plus or minus. That's all that really means. Y'all with me on that? So please just understand that. Okay, I wanted to say that. I wanted to ask you one more thing. Now, we've got current, we've got voltage on primary and secondary. If, and remember these are peak values of voltage, if I wanted the power, I'm not saying I'm going to, but if I wanted the power dissipating that too long, how would you calculate it? Anyway. Real power, average power, anyway. It's, we know it's I squared R, but there would be the one half. Y'all follow me on that one? Because this is not an RMS voltage over there, all right? If this was an RMS voltage, then it would just be I squared R, which is nice because that one half goes away. But in this case, it's peak. Y'all follow me? Y'all get ready to bolt on me, and I guess it's almost that time. 
Now, I wanted to do one, just mention one more thing. I'm going to give you some problems for Wednesday. Would you please? However, I, no, I'd encourage you, I'm not gonna like yell at you if you don't, but would you please do them attentively? Come with questions. Because come Friday, here's the problem. If you wait until Thursday, you're gonna have a pile of questions and you don't know who to ask. And maybe other people are out and about, not available, and then you're really in trouble come Friday. So please do them, because this stuff is not hard, but there's enough uncertainty that if you don't do them and, and ask them, you know, causes the problem. All right, guys, could you bring the extra quizzes up to? People are doing better and better on those quizzes. And I'm happy.